Welcome back to the show, everybody. Glad to have you along for the ride because you may not know that the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the Guam chapter, is now in its 25th year of existence, and we are honored and privileged to welcome to the KUM studios here in Harmon, Frank Shankwitz. He is the founder of the National Make-A-Wish Foundation by way of the great state of Arizona. Frank, half a day, and welcome to Guam. Thank you. I'm just so happy to be here. Okay, well, we here at KUM, we've been so very happy over the years to do so many stories on the local chapter and uh, the very fine work and the commitment that they have to improving the lives of children and making their dreams come true and kids that you know are going through situations that they shouldn't have to um give me up to speed and tell me like what motivated you to actually start the make-a-wish foundation in 1980 i was a motorcycle officer with the arizona highway patrol and told about a little seven-year-old boy named chris whose heroes were punch and john from the television show chips sure but what's special about chris was unfortunately had leukemia and unfortunately diagnosed for only about two weeks to live and the family asked could we just do something special, just meet this little boy. And our department went all out, and with the permission of his doctors, his mother, a, one of our state police helicopters actually went to his hospital. The paramedics picked him up and flew him to our headquarters building, where I was standing by with my motorcycle. And our motorcycle, our uniforms at the time, we had trained with California Highway Patrol, everything was identical to the guys on chips, except for obviously the patches on the uniform. Mm -hmm. And I expect the paramedics to help this little very ill little boy out of this helicopter. Instead, here comes this little seven-year-old just running and jumping. Hi, I'm Chris, big smile on his face. He forgot he was sick. He forgot, just all this energy was going on. And he thought, as far as he was concerned, he was meeting Punch and John. Mm -hmm. I was very tan at the time and had red hair, so I could have been either one. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he just went on that day to just have this most magical day. His wish was becoming true. And we made him the first and only honorary Highway Patrol officer to this day in the history of the Arizona Highway Patrol. And the day went on, the following day complete with the uniform, the badge, the hat, everything assigned to him. In fact, that badge is still assigned to him today, 33 years later. Uh, the following day, we went to his house. We gave him a uniform, custom made for him. He went through his motorcycle test, as we call it, because he really wanted the wings to be a motorcycle officer. And, and again, this boy is just beaming, and again, a doctor said, let him stay home instead of going back to the hospital. And I, we just kept seeing this, and I kept seeing the reaction of his mother. She's got her seven-year-old boy back again. He's just the typical seven-year-old. Uh, we ordered the motorcycle wings for him, and a couple days later, when I went to the hospital, he was in a coma, and they didn't expect to survive the day. I pinned on the wings on the uniform that was hanging right by his bed, and as I did, it's like this miracle thing. He came out of the coma, he looks at me, he looks at the wings, he just starts smiling and laughing. He sat up in bed, and my official motorcycle officer now, yes, you are, Chris. He just, again, started talking to his mom, had the greatest two or three hours, and unfortunately passed away right after that. Mm. But he was gonna be buried in Illinois, and our department asked if I could go back and give, we had lost a fellow police officer as far as the department was concerned could we go back and give him a full police officer's funeral, which we did. And again, the community helped us out. This little town in Illinois, the Illinois State Police joined us, the city police, the county police, they had heard about this little boy. Now he had passed away and they still wanted to do something to enhance his wish. But coming back from Illinois back to Arizona on the flight back, I just started thinking, here's this seven-year-old little boy. He had this illness, but he had a wish and we made it happen. And let's do that for other children. Let them make a wish and we'll make it happen. And that's when the idea was born. Talked to several people. We got uh, five other people involved. My wife, Kitty, one of them. And we started this foundation. It only took months to take this foundation and get the 501c3. In 1981, we granted our first wish, official wish. And now 30, 33 years later, it's 300,000 wishes with 64 chapters, 36 countries, five continents, all because of one little boy. Mm -hmm. But the most amazing thing on this story is that every 38 minutes, somewhere in the world, a wish is granted. And to me, that's still a staggering figure. I, I had a feeling it was going to grow to be worldwide, but that, never, never that figure entered. That's my what mind. I wanted to ask you, and I want to say, speak frankly, Frank. Yes. If, <laughs> if you if you can, has it the rate at which it's grown and and what it's become, and you know the, the amount of good that it's done. Um, on a global scale and everything, has it become everything that you hoped it would be? Yes, and, and, and not trying to be egotistical, but after our first official wish, 
uh, I told our small board that we're going to be national and international someday. And I think we had like $36 left or $12 in the bank account. But we're going to be granting wishes all over the world. And they all laughed at me except one young lady, which is now my wife, Kitty. I mentioned about three years later, she said, I do. So I got my wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. But I, I could just see the growth and the people accepted the idea. Mm -hmm. and, and we just knew it was going to grow. Now, in spreading the word, was it you and your wife more proactively, you know, going out and talking to different communities and, you know, encouraging people to, to get active and, you know, to continue the work that you guys started? Or was, you know, did word spread on its own and people came to you and said, you know, well, hey, I, I heard about that. That's wonderful. How can I get involved? And both. The first part, we got so much great press initially. It, it not only just the local city, and we were in Phoenix, Arizona at the time, but the local papers picked it up, the statewide papers and television. The network, major network, ABC, NBC, started picking up immediately. And this is something new. This is something nobody's ever heard of. And we got instant press, which gave us credibility. And we went out to the donors, but the donors started contacting us. We, we contacted Disney, and it took a little bit to develop that relationship, but what a relationship it was. Mm -hmm. And it was my wife's persistence on the telephone with the Disney people well, that, that opened up that relationship. Well, that leads me into our next question, because I know from talking to the leadership of your local chapter, they said Disneyland is far and away the most requested wish that the kids have. So I wanted to see, in your experience, what has been the wildest, like most extravagant wish that a child has made? And then what, uh, what's the most wild thing that you've actually been able to make come true? That, that's so hard to answer, because there's so many. I mean, when you look at 300,000 wishes, um, Probably one of the, the, and some of them sound so simple. There's, there's the wish, I want to have, I want to meet, I want to go like a travel type wish, or I want to be like a fireman, policeman. And in Arizona, uh, about 400 miles from the Phoenix area is the Navajo Indian Reservation. And a little girl, a little seven-year-old Navajo girl was in the hospital, children's hospital in Phoenix, and it's the first time she had ever seen television. And she was fascinated by the History Channel and the Discovery Channel. And her wish was, I want a television so she could watch these. And the wish granters in Phoenix not being familiar with what's up north on the reservation, that's so easy. We're, we could probably get all this donated. And I told them, they live in a Hogan. They have no electricity, no running water, no toilets. And we're going to do this wish, but it's going to cost about $10,000 because it involved getting generators, getting satellite dishes, mm -hmm. getting fuel up there and enough fuel to run that. But her wish became true. And, and it's just something so simple, but we made it happen for this little girl. Well, the work that you guys have done, obviously very impressive and such a noble cause. So Frank, a true honor to meet you and thank you for coming by. Thank you. All right, and the work that the local chapter does is absolutely amazing. So you should be proud of them because they do oh, amazing Oh, very work. proud. It, it, the community is so small, but yet they're doing an average of 15 wishes a year. And, and that's, when you get the percentages, they're doing an outstanding job here. Mm -hmm. And plus they're keeping the, the donation in a nonprofit world if you can keep 70 cents of every dollar that goes direct to the wish, that's, you're a very high standard, and they're exceeding that. All right. They're exceeding that. All right. Well, thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy your stay here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And stay tuned, my friends, because we will return right after this.